one of the most powerful tools you can have as an artist. And knowing how to use color can take your work from good to great. Hi, my name is Lik Tung Nai. I'm an illustrator from Hong Kong. Now I'm based out of Los Angeles. Today, I'm here to teach you about colors. I think color plays a huge role in my work. It really helps me to provoke the emotion I want. It really helped me to tell a story. It really helped me to single out my heroes. I'm really excited today to talk about colors, not because I'm the expert in it, but because I used to be really bad at it. So I spent a lot of time dissecting colors, looking at other people's work, and I feel like I came a long way from where I was. That's why today I'm hoping to break it down step by step, and maybe that can give people the confidence to develop their own voice in colors. So in today's class, we're going to start really basic, visit some of the foundation of color theories and understanding the terms. And then we're going to look into some masterpieces and um, see how color is working for those artwork as a foundation to build on for your own assignment. We're not going to dive super deep into the nerdy part about color theory in this class. So you don't need to know a lot about colors. All you need really is just your eyes and your hands to follow along. So if you do follow along, please, please share your project in the class project gallery. I would love to see what you guys have come up with. I hope that you'll leave this class with the curiosity and the confidence to try out colors. I'm so glad you have joined this class. Let's get started. So if you tell me 10 years ago I'll be teaching a class on colors, I'll probably laugh at you because unlike lines, um, color is something that doesn't come naturally to me at all. And all through art school, um, color has been my big weakness if you ask any of my past teachers. But I work extra hard at overcoming that weakness and that fear. And I'm really excited to share with you what I did to get to where I am at this point. So I started looking at other people's work, seeing how they use color and not just looking at it, but actually pulling them into Photoshop and sort of isolating the colors with eyedropper, which is what we're going to do today as well. I also started looking at a lot of books um, in patterns and textile because they usually have really interesting color combination that's e easy and uh, simple to just grab and to sort of steal for your own use. And we're going to do that today as well. So essentially, today's class is like a super condensed version of what I did for myself in the past 10 years to get to where I am now with my colors. So how today's class is going to work is that at first we're going to go back to the basic, kind of uh, get familiar again with the color theory, at least the foundation of it, so that we can all have a common vocabulary to uh, talk about the class with. And then we're going to look at some real life pieces, trying to marry that color theory with practice, um, dissecting artists' work, and then see how they're using color to their advantage. And finally, we're going to try to take an existing color palette, break it down, and then create swatches that we can use um, for our own artwork. Even though we might not know how to create color yet, I think it's pretty innate as human to sense color. So when we're choosing the color palette, we're already making a decision of, you know, what kind of emotion I want to sort of borrow from other um, pieces that can be applied to our own. And through the process of refining those colors into our own palette, we're also making decisions um, on the objectives that we want to achieve with those colors. So I've created a piece just for today's class. The work is a little bit more simple than my usual work nowadays. It has a very clear foreground, middle ground, and background. And I recommend that you also have a more simple line drawings and composition to work with. So that way it won't complicate things and we can really just focus on the colors. So just to give you a correct expectation, you're not going to get a PhD of color after this. We're not going to go into a super comprehensive color theory. I'm not an expert in that. This is just something that works for me and make color less scary. If you really want to 
get nerdy about color, uh, which is really fun. I've also included a bunch of useful link in the class resources section. So as you follow along, you might notice the colors is different from the film footage of my screen than the actual video captured on the screen. Um, that just can't be helped because of the light, the glare, the environment factor. So if you're wondering which one is the more accurate color, um, it will be the screen capture. So that would be the one that you reference the color for. So today what you will need for this class is Photoshop or some kind of uh, digital software such as Procreate if you're using iPad. I'll be working on the computer today and on this beautiful uh, tablet. You don't need something that fancy. You can use whatever you use like iPad or a simple like small tablet to draw on. Because colors exist in a surrounding, I like to optimize my workspace to make sure I'm not getting unnecessary distraction. So I'm really seeing the color that I should be focused on. Um, so when I'm at home, which I'm not at right now, my workspace is facing a blank wall. So it gives me minimal distraction. I have to make sure that my screen is not directly under any light or glares. If you are super particular about you know making sure the colors in your screen looks right. You can get those monitor hood that kind of looks like blinders they put on horse. I guess that also keep the colors focus on the screen. Another thing I like to do is to set my desktop to a middle gray. I also set the background on my Photoshop to a middle gray. So then I won't be tainted with colors when I'm making decisions. So when I first start getting my work published, I noticed to my great dismay that the color was wrong in the printed word. And so I look into it and found out that apparently all monitors have different color settings, which I didn't know about before. So what you see, what you spend hours like trying to fine tune on your monitor could look totally different on other people's monitor and in print. And one thing that ha has really, really helped me was a color calibrator, which is this little guy. There are many brands that make this. Um, this is just what I use. So essentially what it does is the software will run these color swatches on your screen and you just put this little guy, like kind of like this on the screen. So it will measure how accurate those color swatches is seeing and kind of calibrate um, your machine that way. So now my color in print is much more accurate. Thanks for this little extra step. One thing you may not know is also your monitor is kind of like a life organism. So the color changes over time as um, the screen ages. So even if you calibrate it, it's good to get into the habit of doing it every once in a while, like once in a month. So feel free to follow along any of the setup tips or not. Um, you don't have to do any of that and you can still follow along. Now that we're all set up, next step, let's dive into colors. So the way that we should approach color is to be very mindful. Before we just started adding color randomly into a piece, we need to ask ourselves, ourselves what are the objectives of doing that. Having the objectives sort of help us make decisions along the way rather than just blindly trying things out. Usually for me, there are three main objectives when I use color. The first one is trying to think about what type of feeling I'm trying to convey. The second one is seeing how I can use colors to move the eyes around to tell the story that way. And the third one is just really bringing the world of the art alive with the colors. So talking about how colors really bring things alive, I recently watched a documentary made by um, Peter Jackson. So he used old black and white World War I footages, but remastered them with colors. First part of the movie before um, Britain go into war and, and the soldier landed on the continent were in black and white. And once we got into the trenches, all of a sudden everything come into color and that contrast was pretty powerful. We always see the black and white as, you know, ancient history, but all of a sudden now 
other people feel so much more real. And then you can see the flash of the color, the rouge on their cheek, and all of a sudden you realize how young those soldiers were and it really hit you that pretty much we're sending a bunch of kids to war. And I felt like that was very emotional for me watching. Now let's use another example of my own work. This one was for a book called Kama Sutra. Some of you might be familiar with that. It's about essentially love and also sex. Um, very different from World War I subject matter, obviously. In this scene, we see a little bit of a afternoon delight of a couple, you know, sneaking a snuggle in a archway. Um, as you can see in the color piece, the warmth of the red and the yellow really bring out the moment of the time and the temperature and the romance because of that. And now we turn that into black and white. All of a sudden we're losing all of that mood and also the different elements become a little bit harder to read. So there's a few common pitfalls when it comes to using color. Um, usually it's just going to extremes, like go, being too bold. So you're using all the colors that you possibly can and using all of them to the extreme uh, when it comes to saturation, or you're being just too timid, um, very much staying in the mid range of the value of the hue. So everything is lacking a clarity or hierarchy. So I always find it really interesting how our senses and our cognition kind of work together. I read this really interesting article about how someone analyzed um, Homer's Odyssey and how in the whole book, um, they describe all kinds of color, but one color was lacking in particular, which was blue. And the way they were describing C was using deep wine color. And someone was making the assumption that because of that, we actually couldn't really see blue for the longest time, at least for, you know, ancient Western civilization. And that got me thinking, like, language in some way, now we have all these different words for different colors. It really help us see those color um, separately and more distinctly, but it also take color out of their context. So we think of color as red, as yellow, as green, as blue, and we see them packaged also in different um, tube of paint. That's all separated. But if you really think about it, color never um, exists in isolation. If you look around in your surrounding, there's no like just red red standing out is always within its own context. So color is more of this shifting fabric of hues and values. And sometimes it's easy to forget that and that become a challenge when applying colors. And nowadays with the digital tool, it further disrupt that relationship because in the old days, when you're mixing color with paint, you're physically um, combining the pigments to create new colors. So if you start with five tubes of paint and then you create 20 colors. Mm -hmm. All those 20 colors have the same um, sort of parents that they were created from. So they have an inherent harmony that's built in. But whereas now you can just use your color picker um, and pick any colors you want from you know, Photoshop. And it's very easy to end up with something that looks like a vomit of rainbow that just you know, looks jarring. There's also this sort of prevailing misconception when it comes to color. And I feel like that also has something to do with our language and our vocabulary. For example, when we think of something that's bright, we think of, you know, adding white. If we think of something dark, we think of adding black. But that actually creates very lifeless um, color palette because everything in our surrounding is actually mixed with multiple colors rather than just simply adding black or white. The same as people thinking, if I want to make an image look really brilliant, then I have to use saturated color. It seems to make sense in our mind, the logic, but I'm gonna show you some pieces that is gonna disprove that. So the first step, we're gonna talk about the principles of colors. And before that, let's review the terminologies so we can all be on the same page when we're having the discussion about colors. As you can see here, we have hue, value, and saturation, some of the most 
commonly used term when we discuss colors. So hue essentially is just color. Different hues mean different color, as you can see here. And value means the different shades of color, like lighter or darker. Saturation essentially just means how pure that color is, how intense that color is, and how chromatic that color is. So what does hue, value, and saturation actually look like when we open the color picker in Photoshop? Um, so this is how you read it. Like this little bar, as you switch along, you're switching different hues. So you're picking different color. Um, as you go left to right, that's the increase of the intensity or the increase of saturation of that color. And as you go from top to down, you're um, changing the value of that color. So the top is lighter and the downside is darker. And sometimes you may hear people describe colors as cool color or warm color. And that pretty much just mean where the color sits on the color wheel. So all the warm color are on this side, as you can see, things that are related to, you know, the sun or the heat or the warm color, blues, purples, these are the cool colors. But if you want to really go into it, even like red, there could be a warm red or a cool red. A cool red just means it has more blue in it and a warm red just means it has more orange in it. So now that we're clear on the terminologies, I have five key points that I always keep in mind when I'm designing my palette. The five key points are, number one, color relativity. Number two, color consistency. Number three, value contrast. Number four, accent colors. Number five, um, ratios in complementary colors. The importance of understanding these key points is not to stick to them, but to really understand why and what they do. And that way, um, you can use them and break them um, to achieve what you want to convey uh, successfully as well. In some way, color is very similar to alphabet. If I just give you like an A or a D or a F, it doesn't really mean anything, but only when they are together and form a relationship, then you get the meaning. And color is just like that. So why is it so important to understand that color works in relationship? It's because when our brain intake colors, um, it translates those colors into meanings, such as temperature, time of day, or object. So as an artist, what we want to do is to harness the power of color and to recreate all those um, meanings to our brain um, with colors. So here I have a few simple examples to show how color can look drastically different when it's put into different neighboring color. The first example up is relative hue. Like for example, in this case, these two colors look very similar or some may say they're the same color, but really if you put them into a neutral background, it becomes really apparent that they're totally different color and now they look super different. It's only because they're put in different hues and that makes them look like two gray rectangles. Okay, now let's move into relative value. In this case, uh, many people may swear that this rectangle is much lighter compared to this one. But now let's remove the neighboring color. And on a neutral gray, it reveals that they're actually the, exactly the same color. So now let's, let's talk about relative temperature. Temperature just means if a color is warmer or cooler. In this block, the color looks warmer than this block. Um, but if we remove the neighboring color, we realize they're the same color again. And the reason why this one looks warmer is because it's surrounding by a cooler color. So a really great example for how color works in relativity is this infamous blue dress versus white dress case. A lot of people probably remember and participated in this debate. And this example really show how when people are focusing on the actual color of the dress or they are trying to decode the color of the dress using information with a surrounding and light, you can see totally different colors. I actually saw it as 
blue and black in the beginning. But when I tried to focus on other aspects of the image, my brain was able to switch for a second to see it being um, gold and white, and that was super wild. So as you can see, this is the original photo that was so controversial. And if we sort of edit it to reinforce certain aspects of that photo, like for example, make it brighter, now it looks a lot more like it's gold trimmed with a on a white dress. But if we make it darker, now it looks a lot more like a blue dress with black trim. So now let's talk about color consistency, which just means color should live in the same world, if you want to convey a believable world, that is. The reason why this is so important, especially nowadays with the digital tool, is because the colors sort of exist in vacuum. You just pick whatever color you like, whereas in the old day, you're mixing the pigment um, the problem was that the color tends to get too muddy. Nowadays, the color just simply don't have relationship with each other if you're not mindful of building that relationship. To kind of convey why color consistency is important, I have borrowed a piece from Toma Hanuka. So you can see this beautiful piece here. He has established a color system. So the light area is represented here with the blue, and then the darker area and the water part is the purple. So when the light hits, you see the blue. Anything submerged is the purple. I kind of did a quick slide with the hue saturation. I just slide it all the way to 180. What it does is shifting every color here um, to the other side of the color spectrum. And as you can tell, because all the color were shifted together, the color system he has built is still holding up together. Um, here, the light is in pink, and the water and the shadow is in this olive green. But when I start to divorce a certain part of this image, I put a layer mask here, and only now the body part of the people are being shifted into the other spectrum of the color, you can see the people is starting to really pop out of the background, but not in a good way. There's no more consistency with the light in the background with its effect on the people. And they just don't look like they're submerged in that water anymore. So I think what really taught me looking at his art is that your color don't have to be real in the sense that it looks like what we see every day. But as long as if you establish this consistent rules of colors in the world you create, it will still read. Because here we have clearly established the light is the blue, and then the water is the purple. We understand this instinctively, that the people are not actually blue people. It's just that they're submerged in the water. In some case, though, breaking that color consistency can actually be a good tool as well. Um, one great example is Marilyn Monroe by Andy Warhol. As you can see, all the colors are all over the place, and that's what it gives a really pop and flat aesthetic to the image. And that's what the artist was going for. Next up is contrast, and we can think of contrast sort of like this gradient that we're seeing. Um, with the absolute white being zero and the darkest black being 10. So by harnessing the power of contrast, you can effectively direct people's eyes and where they're gonna look in your image. So here we have two examples. The contrast system is a little bit clearer than in this photo here, which I pulled from the internet. This art is by Ivan Earl. And both images you can see is a woodland scene with a pretty clear pathway leading somewhere. So now let's discard the color so we can really see their um, value structure. So as you can see now with both images in black and white, the pathway that was obvious in the picture in the photo here become um, kind of lost. So what this is telling us is that the color was the one doing the heavy 
lifting and directing the eyes in this sense, whereas in this image, we can still see the path and how the eyes read clearly following the highest contrast here in the foreground and then following a lower contrast here in the middle ground and then into the sky, which has a very close contrast value with the white. You may wonder why we're talking about like black and white value contrast um, when this is a color class. Value contrast is the probably the most powerful tool in directing our eyes. So what it does with a solid value is that it frees up um, or it liberates the colors. Like as long as the um, value system is greatly set up, um, you can kind of use crazy color and the image will still read really well. This image has a really nicely set up value hierarchy with the highest contrast in the foreground. So your eyes kind of follow that and then into the middle ground with the contrast around like five to zero and then to the background with a contrast around two to zero. And then we have this like dark shape tree right here and with the shadow kind of like lead our eyes right back in the center and then um, the whole circle get repeated. So our eyes just like keep investigating into the scene rather than just, you know, drop out of the image. So this example is actually really good at showing how value is doing the heavy lifting in directing our eyes. What I did is actually change the colors in this image, but following the same value structure. Like here, the trees are actually um, darker blue. Um, it doesn't have as high a value number as the like close to black in the original, but in relationship, it still follow the similar rules and it still read really well. In this case, it become a maroon, like burgundy color, but the value structure is still the same as the original and it still read really well. And in this one, the color palette got shifted to purple, but still the same value structure and it still works. And that's essentially what I meant by um, having a solid, contrast hierarchy can really free up your color palette. So what I really like to do when I work in Photoshop is to have a hue saturation layer up top. Um, so when I'm working, I often go back and check the hue saturation layer with the saturation turned all the way down just to see what my piece value structure look like in black and white. And this is also a really good way to sort of refresh your eyes after you turn that layer off and then see the colors again. Mm -hmm. And that often helped me make color decision choices. Another great way to move eyes around this time using color is accent color. So what is accent color? It's usually color that's a bowl with high intensity and used sparingly uh, throughout the image to direct the direction of eyes. But it doesn't always have to be um, high intensity colors. It really depends on the overall color relativity in the piece. So in the piece that is mostly, for example, like bright orange, you can have a couple dots of muted green and that could actually be the accent color. So here's another piece by our friend Ivan. In this example, the red clearly is the accent color and the few of cool blue. So our eyes just go there immediately. And you can see he's also using his tricks of contrast again, where the 10 highest black, darkest black, with the zero, the whitest white, where it's neighboring. And this is where our eyes is drawn to. And now we can look at it in black and white. So without the accent color, um, the highest contrast is still here, but it takes a minute for us to kind of arrive here rather than just now, it was very immediate. Here's another uh, masterpiece by John Singer Sargent of using accent color. As you can tell, red is used quite a bit in accent color because red is one of the color that has the strongest emotional impact to us humans since the inside of our body is red. We see blood as red. So usually it sort of has a alerting effect. In this case, it's set up the three red part, the red of the dress, the pinkish red of the doll, and the red of the space partition form a classic triangle 
composition that just keep moving our eyes around and really having the image activated. Now I have this adjustment layer with the red turn off. It's actually changed into blue into a similar hue as the rest of the image. And all of a sudden you may notice that the contrast over here become a lot more prominent. Our eyes just go straight here and then kind of fall off the page because we don't have the agency to bring us back and continue that lovely circle in this composition. Because accent color is so effective, it's really important that we place it wisely. Take this piece by Ivan as an example. If we crop it in, have the red right at the edge, that it really leads our eyes to the edge and then sort of fall off the page. And because there's no other element or other reds around here to bring us back in, the circulation just kind of stop. I think one of the goal of creating an image is to keep our eyes in the image for as long as possible. Like here we have the red, and then we still have this little breathing room that brings us down here. And then this like middle grade of contrast that lead us right back to the house and it keep going on and on and on. When we talk about color ratio, what we're really talking about is deciding and letting one color be the leader and then letting other colors uh, play the supporting role. This is especially true when it comes to complementary colors, such as green and red. And complementary colors just mean color that's sitting right across from each other, opposite each other on the color wheel. So. When complementary colors are used in equal part, whether in size or intensity, they sort of diminish each other rather than creating this beautiful kinetic energy that could be when they're used well. So here's a beautiful piece by Julia Noni, one of my favorite working photographer right now. Her composition, as you can tell, is amazing. Same with her understanding of value structure. But what I love the most is her use of complementary colors. Here we have this dominating bright red and then completed with this muted olive green that sort of merge and melt seamlessly into this dark figure, creating a beautiful silhouette. And then I sabotage it by changing the green into the same intensity as the red and also bringing in more green. So now the ratio of the color green occupying the space is the same as the amount of space the red is occupying. As you can tell, it become a little bit confusing to our eyes now. The two colors is fighting for attention. Instead of supporting each other, they are actually making the piece a lot weaker compared to the original one. So at this point of the class, we're going to look at other artists' work through the lenses of the key points we just talked about. So you know that I'm not just straight up making stuff up. So for me, one of the best way to really learn about color and also to debunk a lot of the color misconception is by looking at other artists' pieces, really dissecting it and to see um, why the color feels or convey the message as they do in a systematic way, not just purely feeling, because feeling can be very misleading. I think when we see a masterpiece, everything comes so well together that we almost take it for granted. There's a saying by Picasso, um, it takes a lot of effort to look effortless. So when we see something that's so effortless, we have to remind ourselves that every brushstroke on the canvas was an active decision. So this is a piece called Fishing for Oyster at Kenko by John Singer Sargent. He's really a master when it comes to color and composition. You may notice there are like all this water paddle on the beach and think, okay, sure, beach, water paddle. So what, right? But then if you cover those paddle up, like what I did in this manipulated version, all of a sudden the image become a lot more stagnant. Without the water paddle, there's no more circulation around from the top part of the image to the bottom and have your eyes sort of circle around the figures. And here it is in the original and here in my sabotage version. 
then you realize how genius it really is to put those petal in so it can reflect the sky blue colors. And again, if you squint your eyes, that's a good way to sort of diminish the impact of color and see the value. Then you'll see the highest contrast is around here. And that's where your eyes is going to focus on. Now let's take a look at this uh, concept art piece for Cinderella by Mary Blair. You may think that the brightest color here is this pink. And let's take a look. It's not really that saturated. It's kind of in the middle range. Now let's take a look at this part. It's even, even less saturated, kind of at the one third range. And let's take a look at the shadow. It's actually around the same saturation as the pink, if not a little bit more towards the red side. So it's actually more saturated. A lot of people don't really realize Usually the most saturated color is at the darker color and the shadow color, such as this part. To further illustrate that point, let's look at a Monet piece. Again, here the pink appear very vibrant. So let's pick it up and see what that looks like. Again, it's very neutral. It's like not even halfway through the saturation, which we understand is reading from the left to the right. And let's look at those beautiful bright greens here. It's right in the middle. Again, not very bright. What about the yellows here? Again, right in the middle. And now let's take a look at the shadow. All of a sudden, whoop, we jump to the edge. Now let's take a look at this example by Victor Higgins. The statue is practically glowing with light. Let's take a look at the saturation of it. There's almost no color in that. Even the wings, it's just barely in the middle. The lighter part has actually become less saturated. So in this piece, what really contributes to the glowing effect is contrast. Because even in the black and white, it really feels like there's a lot of light being reflected by the statue. But now, as we can see in black and white, the reading become a lot more one dimensional. We zoom in into the statue and then maybe see a little bit of the highlight here and then that's it. And then if we go back to the color version, here's a beautiful use of complementary color with the green as the accent color. As you can notice, this is the only bright green in the whole image in the dominating red environment. So we might first see the highest contrast with the statue and then we follow the statue our eyes and sort of linger around this female and wonder what she's looking at. And she's here clearly as the heroine of this image being established by this accent color. Here's a beautiful, beautiful piece by author Hacker. The color gives such luminosity and really makes you feel like the girl is in front of a fireplace. And that's the power color has when it's used right. We don't see the light source at all, but we can feel the heat and the temperature. When I was in college, my teacher Chris Buzzelli once said a really good art piece should be packed with adjective instead of just noun. For example, in this piece, the nouns are girl, cat, teapot. But the reason why this piece is so great is because of the adjective that we can find in it, such as warm or luminous. That is what really give us the feeling that we have towards this piece. And now let's take a look at this like practically glowing fluorescent green here. It's like practically jumping out of the page, but let's take a color picker and see how saturated it really is. It's almost not a green. It's like this gray color. Let's take a look at the other part of the green. Okay, so this one read as a green, but still very much a muted green. And the reason why these greens feel so bright or saturated to us is precisely because of the color relativity that we talk about. Everything else is very orangey red. And because of that, they seem a lot greener than they really are. Now that we have a look at many master's pieces, 
Now let's take a look at the student of the masters,、uh, which is me, and see how、um, I learn the things from my heroes and apply to my work. So here's a book cover for the Green Children of Wolpit that I've done recently. I feel like when you're working on a project with text, there's always a clue to color in that text. In this case, it's pretty obvious. It's the Green Children. The kids are green, and they came from a world that is all green. So it makes sense to me that the color should also have a green tint, and that's kind of how I. First, establish the overall tone of the image. Besides being green, the kids are also kind of creepy. They came from this other underground world, and it's sort of a mystery throughout the story if they're good or they are evil to a human. So we sort of want a sense of mystery on that cover, and I decided to. Give it sort of like a low lighting situation to enhance that feeling of unknown. And when we see in low light, our eyes tend to see like the blues and the greens better than we see the reds. The reds tend to become more like black and dark color. So let's talk about this piece with the five key points that we covered so far. The first one is relativity, which. Really is understanding color and、um, seeing them as a continuous fabric. So that is more like a ongoing backdrop for the four other things we talk about. The second point is consistency. In this piece, for example, it's a low light environment with a green tint, so everything has to live in that world to feel like it belongs. I'm also using the value that we talk about. To establish a kind of eye movement,、um, our eyes are being drawn towards this kiss, and then we kind of follow this like dark shape of curve, go up, and then see the girl here, who is also a、um, heroine in the story, and the curve of the shape also directs the eye, which is、um, more on the composition side rather than what we talk about today with value and colors, kind of bring us back to this kiss. The fourth point is accent color. In this case, is the red here. I use it very sparingly, and only around area that I want your eyes to really focus on. A little bit up top, so then to create that circulation we see in the John Singer Sergeant piece we saw earlier. And the last point is ratio, which is closely tied in with the accent color as well. Like imagine if I have red everywhere. And have this red the same intensity as this green. We can take a look.、Um, this green is around the middle of the saturation side, and then we can take a look at this red. It's a lot more muted, or even here, it's a lot more muted and darker. So that way, it support each other rather than competing with each other. Now, when we're working on something like this one, which is a book cover with type on it, we have to consider the type as part of the composition, and therefore consider its value impact as well. So here's an example of the same cover without the type. As you can see, the value all of a sudden feels a lot more muted, and with the type, the value structure feels a lot more completed. So now that we cover the key points, and I've shown you how I dissect other artists' piece, why don't you guys also pick a piece that you really like, bring it to Photoshop, use the eyedropper tool to really understand the color, maybe turn it into black and white as well to see what their value structure looks like. Now that we have gone through all of this,、um, we're entering into the exciting part of the class, which is stealing other people's palette and then make it into your own. So what are we gonna do now?、Um, first, we're gonna pick a limited palette. So what does the limited palette means? I think for this classic,、uh, it just means a palette consists of less than ten colors, including black and white. Now you may think that sounds like a lot, but if you really did the exercise we just did, like color picking other artists' work, you notice like in the painterly work there are over thousands of colors, and in the graphic work usually there's. Like more than ten as well, so I think ten color is a pretty good place to start、uh, to have a good selection of color in different hues and values and saturation. 
and we will build upon that to have like a second generation of colors that's being generated from the first set of swatches that we took from other people. So now let's talk about what kind of art would be good for this exercise. This is the sketch that I prepared for this class. I think it's a good idea to pick something a little bit simpler so we can really focus on the colors and not get confused by the complexity of the image. So in this one, we have a clear foreground, a clear hero, which is the girl. And then we have a middle ground, uh, the tree with a bird in it, and a background, which is just the sky. Pretty simple hierarchy and three major elements that we're working with. Before we really get into color, I just want to talk a little bit about color mode because that was something really confusing for myself and maybe confusing for you as well. So color mode can be changed here. Mostly we work with two color mode. One is RGB and one is CMYK. RGB is the mixing of color light, red, green, and blue, and that's how monitors display the colors. And the CMYK is a four color separation that's being used by industrial printing. So C is cyan, which is blue. M is magenta, which is red. Y is yellow, which is yellow. K is black, because in the back of the days when the colors were actually like etched into plate, the black is called a key plate. That's why now it's K, CMYK. We should also take a look at the color setting because you realize that within RGB and CMYK, there are different working spaces as well. And this is probably the most confusing part. Here right now we're at sRGB, which is the default setting for most monitors, most cameras, and most internet browsers. And if you go down, open this up, you see there's other options, many, many other options. So another common one is Adobe RGB. Adobe RGB has a wider range of color display, around like 35% more than sRGB. And you might think more is better. In some cases, yes. Um, because it has more colors, it's able to be more color accurate if you print a piece with the Adobe RGB setting. But when you try to show your work online, um, the color tends to get duller and muted because the internet browsers is unable to read all this color in um, Adobe RGB. So I think for this project, if you're thinking of mostly showing off your work in our you know, classroom share or on Instagram or you know, online, then sRGB is probably the way to go. But if you are wanting to print it out, for example, with a nice Epson stylus printer, then um, Adobe RGB is the way to go. If you are going to mass produce this and send it to press, then CMYK is the way to go. And this is a pretty commonly used uh, working space for CMYK. Um, now we have it set to um, R RGB. I will just pick the one for the web. Here I have a finished line drawing that was based on my sketch. As you can tell, it's pretty close. I always think it's important to spend more time with your sketch because it's a quick way to fix any composition problem before you get into um, the finished line drawing. The last thing you want is to spend like hours on the drawing and then realize that the whole thing has a very weak composition foundation. So here we are, and what I like to do before adding color is to just create flats. And if that's not familiar with you, flats are essentially how comic artists work. It just means shapes of flat color, um, not the final color, just like a placeholder for each major element. So then the color of that element can easily be changed. So the Lasso tool is something I use a lot. I use a magnetic one as well because right now the contrast is pretty high, so it's pretty easy to select. So what is the magnetic lasso does is that it sort of snap to places with high contrast. So as you can see here, I am loosely following the guideline um, and it kind of snapped into place. It's not gonna be 100% accurate, but we can always go back and fix it later. It's just a quick way to 
make the flats as opposed to using the regular lasso too because then you have to be like super steady with your hand and having that magnetic snapping allows shaky hands and then we just open a new layer and fill that color now when you fill the color you don't want to use like really crazy like neon green or blue or magenta because that's gonna kind of mess up your color judgment so i tend to stay in the neutral and maybe if you have colors that you already know you want to use sort of in that range and i always like to organize my layers in folders here so then when you get a lot of different layers they won't be super confusing so here we have this layer filled and then you just kind of go on so as you can see like here i already made the selection now i'm just adding color to it so i can read which layer is which and at this point it really doesn't matter what color you put like i can have a gray tree it doesn't mean you have to stay gray it's just easy for yourself to distinguish one part of the image from another part of the image so here I'm pretty much done with most of the big shapes. You can see with the women here, I broke it down into three parts. The dress here, um, the body here, and the hair. Right now the tree is still, the leaf is just one part with the branch as the second part and then the bird on top. So now go ahead and pick a piece of work from yourself that shares similar quality with the example I just said, a simpler shape, clear foreground, middle ground, and background. And then we'll dive into the colors. So as I mentioned before, when I first started out, color was one of my biggest weakness when it comes to picture making. Sometimes I have a very particular feeling that I want to convey with my art but I'm not exactly sure what those feelings looks like in colors. Or sometimes I want to use one particular color very much, but not sure what other colors I can pull to support that hero color. And what really helped me personally is by browsing a lot of different kind of palette and then pulling them and just straight up stealing them and try to make that work with my own piece. And that's what you guys are going to do today as well. Welcome to the dark side. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so we're, our dark side is not like really dark, that dark. Like even though we're stealing, we're not stealing like everything. And I think it's very important that you kind of steal from artists that works really different from you. So even if you use the exactly same palette, your work in the end will be totally different. What's more, when we uh, use their color is usually just a foundation. We're going to build on top of that and then develop the color further to suit the piece that we're working on. So in the end, it's not going to really look like the original color palette that you start out with. So talking about stealing, there's technique to stealing as well. You can't just steal everything. Like painterly pieces are very hard to steal because the color um, shift pretty much, you know, every brushstroke or every pixel so it's hard to really narrow down like what are the major um, six seven colors they use so in the beginning it's much easier to steal when the colors are clearly separated in an image for example old propaganda poster or new vol posters or textile or wallpaper pattern these are all pretty easy examples to pick the colors out there are also a lot of useful design color palettes that's around online. They just give you the swatches straight up, so you don't even need to do the hard work of color picking, which is very manually demanding. But I personally prefer to collect uh, the materials that I color steal from, because I think the process of curating, you also building your own visual library. You're also curating your own tastes and preferences, and eventually that's gonna become part of your own art style as well. So I haven't always worked in digital. When I figured out that color was my weakness, um, the first media that I turned to was actually silk screening because you're able to pre-mix the color, test it out, 
and see what they look like before you commit to a palette. And you can do things in layer, which kind of translate to how I work nowadays in Photoshop. There's a lot of sim sim similarity with the layering system. Here's a pretty early piece that I did. And here's what the color palette that I stole from. And I think this piece is pretty obvious why I stole the color palette. Like I want a piece that sort of have that propaganda vibe going on. And even the composition with, you know, the glowing sun and everything. Here's another one with more of a different composition, but I just really love the color palette in this poster that I try to see if I can make it work into my work, even though it shares nothing similar with composition. And the last one is more of a recent piece. And this one, I sort of want to revisit the old simplicity look of the screen printing and just really using flat colors, no gradient and no complicated texture. And you can see on the right is the color inspiration for that. So now that we have finished making flats for all the major elements, let's uh, think about what kind of color palette we are looking for. We can always seek emotional and tonal clues from our piece. Like in mine, I feel like it's pretty soft, uh, quite feminine, and it's around springtime right now. So I was thinking about something pink, and that clue gives me a direction of my research, hunting down a color palette. So one of my favorite places to look for uh, color resources is my bookshelf. I have collected a lot of books just for the color. This is a series of books. This is one of them uh, from the V&A Museum in uh, England. It has amazing collection, just different kind of textile and different pattern. Uh, so I kind of bookmarked the ones that I thought could work that has the kind of like soft uh, pink that I'm looking for. Uh, this is one of them. And then this is another one. Here's is another book from the same series. Um, I thought this is a pretty cool palette, uh, a little bit more modern maybe with the pink as well. So I looked through uh, a few more books and in the end, I decided I want to make this my pattern. So this book are actually textile from Kimono. Uh, just really zoom in to show you the pattern on it. And I think this is a, a really lovely palette. So I'm going to pull that into the computer. So when you're working with analog resources, there's a few ways you can easily get it into Photoshop to pick the color out. Uh, scanning is one of them, um, or taking it with your smartphone. Everyone has a smartphone now. Make sure the color environment is good. White light, so it's not tinted with yellow. If it is off, you can always adjust it a little bit before you pick out the color in Photoshop. So I just took an image uh, with my phone and then bring it into a computer. And now I'm going to pick out the color with the eyedropper and create swatches that I can use later. So what I'm going to do first is I have created a new layer on top of this. And on that new layer, I'm going to set a gray bar background so that I can see the color I picked out. I'll just pick a mid gray there and then fill it. And then have another layer on top of the gray layer. And now I can start using the eyedropper tool. So first we pick the green here, a pink, this light yellow, this white part, this gray with a blue tint, this red, And finally, this dark purple. So now we have a seven color swatches that like we can bring into our work and use it. So I added the neutral color bar there just so I can see the color clearly, not being distracted by 
uh, this layer right here. And also I think it's an interesting exercise to kind of understand color and see how the key points we are talking about, especially color relativity, is at work. For example, here like the green looks a lot more vibrant because it's adjacent to a sort of complementary pink. Um, but here on the neutral gray, it starts to look a lot duller. Um, so as you can see now, I have the color palette that I just built and then I dragged it into this loosely colored flat file and I can start to apply them to the different layers. Keeping in mind with the hierarchy that I want the image to have. And obviously like in this one, I want the attention is with the lady. So I think I'm gonna have the red be in her hair because that's gonna be the most attention grabbing color. So this is her hair layer. I have it on layer lock. What that does essentially is locking the pixel. Notice if I don't have the layer lock and I try to fill, it just, you know, filled it everything outside or I have to really aim for it. Um, but if I have the layer lock, then I could just use short key to fill, which is odd delete to fill the foreground color. Um, that just makes the process a little bit faster for myself. And we remember that the higher contrast give you the most attention. So let's think about using a lighter color for her skin. So then we have the high contrast with the hair and her skin. So let's pick this sort of near white color with a tint of blue here. And then again, we can use a shortcut to fill it or you can simply fill it with this tool as well. And I think the shape, I sort of want the body to read as a continuous shape and right now this part is breaking it up. So I'm probably gonna turn the red dress into a similar value um, with the skin color and the yellow seems like a good choice. Now let's move on to the background, which is, you know, another big, big part um, and really sort of contribute to the mood of the image. I sort of want that romantic pink feeling we have. So I'm going to grab this baby pink and then turn into the background. As you can see, all of a sudden, um, the sort of light really changed in the image. So now all of a sudden it feels a lot more warm and amicable than before. And now let's also change the tree. So what we're doing here essentially is replacing all the placeholder color with one of the color from this swatches. And this is still like a rough step. So some of the color might not work like so well. Oh, see here, I didn't lock it. That was a good demonstration of what you shouldn't do. Here. Um, and you can just keep going until you have pretty much filled out all the flat that you have created. And at this point, like, don't worry too much that I feel like I'm short on color yet. We're going to expand on that. Like right now, just try to um, stick with the swatches and use all of them for all your layers of flats. You can go ahead and do what I just did, create swatches and then use the swatch apply to your layers of flats. Um, and the next step, we'll start developing those colors. Okay, so at this point, we have applied all the color from the swatches onto all our flat layers already. And honestly, I'm quite liking the direction it's going. And some of you might even say, okay, it looks pretty done. Like maybe that's the flat comic style you're going for, and that's totally fine. I think knowing when to stop is always a difficult question. And it sort of changes as you get more experience, you have a better uh, understanding graphs of it. But at this point, I feel like going with your gut is the probably the best thing. And if you feel like your art piece has already, you know, achieved the goals that you had in mind, then feel free uh, to stop anytime. But for me, I feel like this piece has the potential to get 
even better, especially keeping in mind the brain feeling that I want to convey. I feel like it's still a little bit stiff, uh, so I'm going to keep going. So as I'm looking at this piece right now, I think what stands out to me the first is the skin color. I feel like it's just a little bit too white and because um, the color I picked from the swatch has this like light blue tint, it makes her feel a little bit zombie-ish and that's going against that warm feeling uh, that I have. At this point, like we can create secondary color by using the color from the swatches. So. I'm going to go into the women layer and then find her skin, which is this layer. I'm going to duplicate this layer by pressing Command J, and then you see a layer here. Or you can use this to duplicate that layer. I just like to use a um, short key because it's much faster. So now we have a new layer of the same thing. Again, we locked it. And I was thinking maybe adding some of the pink will help. So this layer, I'm going to make it into the pink layer. Um, let's fill it. This is the layer. So now I have this top layer of the skin. Now the skin has two layers, being pink. But then it's merging too much with the background. So I can always adjust opacity, maybe like 50 to let the bottom layer show through. So now by virtually having two layers on top of each other and then the top layer semi-transparent, I'm creating a new color. So after the skin is done, now my eyes really got drawn to the bird because the bird seems pretty high contrast as well and I want to tone that down. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to duplicate this one layer, layer lock it. Um, I kind of want to keep the like mid-ground uh, color relationship in the greens. So I'm going to use the green here um, onto this duplicated layer. And then do the same thing, adjust the opacity. So now I feel like uh, the bird is much more pushed back in space. So then our lady can come forward. All this little flying leaves, we haven't changed the color so it's still white and it's really popping forward because of the high contrast. So let's go ahead and also give it some color and push it back. Maybe give it um, yellow right now. So as you can see, this way we can create new colors from the original colors of the swatches by blending them virtually and changing the opacity. So at this point, I'm pretty happy with uh, the main colors that I put in um, with all the elements. The image is definitely getting softer and towards like where I want it to be. But one thing really um, jumped out to me is actually the line now. Like we have to remember the line is also part of the image and the line color is also part of the color system here. And um, the black line just started to feel a little too harsh. Again, that's more of a stylistic choice. Like generally, I like something a little more painterly in the outcome rather than uh, something that's maybe more graphic. So let's go ahead. I think, for example, with this one, let's find the hair layer. Lines. Okay, so it's always good to double check that's the layer you want. Even just by, you know, again, blending it with opacity, like softening it, like maybe a 40 or 45%, it's already, I feel like, a better than just a black black. And then with the body line, um, that's another thing. Like I like to, because this piece I work uh, digitally and I, knew that I want to change the color of the line eventually. So I kind of work on the lines on separate layers so it's easy for me to change the color that way. But if you work traditional with your line scanning in, you can always still separate um, your lines like the way you separate the flats. So let's give that arm a pink color. And now I feel like we're kind of losing a little bit of her lips because it's become the same color of the cavity inside her mouth. So I'm gonna pick up this color that I just created by turning down the 
the black opacity of the hairline. So now there's a new color, and I'm going to use that for the outline for her mouth. And then you can keep doing this um, for the other part of the image until you get to the point that you feel like everything feels nice and soft in this case, or whatever you're trying to achieve with your piece. As you can see here, I have changed all the colors of my line at this point. And to me, I think the color can still use a bit more depth. And I think I'm going to introduce a light source to really help with that um, atmospheric perspective. So I think I love to use gradient a lot. Um, I forgot who mentioned this, but they're saying gradient essentially is the passage of time which I think is quite romantic because like, if you look in our nature, the time we see gradients, usually like sunrise or sunset, with very dramatic change of time. So I think with this piece, the light source is going to come down from up here, and that will be really nice because she's looking up here, and this can create like a focus with the light and her direction of looking. And usually with light, we think of like yellow light as more of the sun and more warmth, like uh, bluish light, more like electronic, more artificial, or like really morning, sort of a cool light. In this case, I think it's definitely more of a warm light situation. So I'm gonna have a new layer, and then I'm gonna grab my gradient tool here, and I think I'm gonna use this yellow. So right now pretty much I'm still using the color we already have. We can always tweak those colors later as we go. And all of a sudden I feel like that just gives you know so much depth to the piece. Like the air all of a sudden on top feels lighter. There's a direction. And talk about color consistency. Now I feel like the hair is not reflecting this surrounding anymore. So I'm going to do a layer duplicate like we just did and then also introduce the same yellow light. But now I'm actually picking up this new yellow light which was blend from the pink and the earlier yellow from the dress for this one. And then fill her hair and then add a layer mask. I love doing layer mask because that way you can control the layer, change the layer without actually uh, altering anything. Like for example, I'm going to have a gradient, but then I can turn off this layer mask and it's still, you know, an intact layer. So you can always kind of like go back if you don't like what you did and it's non-destructive, which is really great. I like the gradient, but I feel that maybe it's a little bit strong. So I'm going to adjust the layer opacity to come down a little bit. around there. Now I'm going to do the same with the tree. Duplicate the layer and then apply the same yellow. Do the layer mask. Have the gradients. So in layer mask, um, it works as black being the negative, white being the positive. So now I'm having a gradient of black up, meaning like these parts are being erased. So showing the layer underneath it right here. So now I'm visually blending color that way. And then I'm also gonna turn down that opacity a little bit so as not to lose that green too much into the background. So I'm liking the direction and where we're going. I think the big shapes are in good place. So it's time to kind of get into the secondary shape and really enrich the image and add some complexity and interest to, to it. The first thing I think we need to create sort of like glowing orb for this flower. Um, the line is already kind of hinting that it's glowing, but not so much yet. So this is the layer that I added with the same color as the dress. But obviously we need to tone down the opacity so we can actually see the flower. And now with this framing, the flower is getting more attention than before as well. As you can see, I also added some gradient to 
the knees and the hands, where it's usually a little bit more red in the human body. So it just feels a lot more flashy uh, than before. And now we can go ahead and can make a new layer and then put it into a new group from this layer, uh, secondary shapes. I always title them. I like to keep my file sort of organized because that way when I right click on something, the title showed up, then I would know like what it is, especially when you have like over a hundred layers, which happened with my work. So now we can really zoom in and then pretty much the same thing as our flats before. And we can still use our magnetic tool or other lasso tool to create secondary flats. And with the secondary flats, I'm just gonna, at this point, um, use placeholder colors as well. I'm gonna just clean up the selection. Right here. And then just creating more secondary shape. So you can tell this one kind of messed up. The magnetic got pulled away um, by another strand of line. So you can, when you press down Alt, the lasso tool become a subtraction lasso tool. So then you can correct your selection that way. Or you can press Shift and the lasso become a additive lasso. So it adds to your selection. I'm gonna also do the secondary shape for the leaves as well. So again, new layer, put it into a new folder, secondary shapes. Another tool that I like to use to sort of get selection is just, you know, quick magic wand. And if you click here, which is sample all layers, uh, it takes in all la layers into consideration. And what it's doing is selecting that one area that's being surrounded by, you know, different color. So if I don't have this on, is sampling only this empty layer. So essentially it select the whole thing. But if I have sample all layer on, then it look at the image as everything, all the layer together, and it only select this part. And that's what I want. So I'm gonna make a bunch of quick leaf secondary selection. Whoops. See, here's a little gap, that's why it went over. So this part might not be that good for um, using a magic tool, which is fine. We'll go back in there with a lasso. And then you can just keep doing this until you feel like um, you have covered most of the secondary shape that you want to add like different color to. So at this point, I have selected all my secondary elements. Uh, and when I select, I usually have a general uh, rule that I use. With the secondary element, what I want to do is create volumes within one bigger shape. For example, in this hair, where I think would be the highlight, I put a lighter color in. And where I think would be in shadow or a concave, I put a darker shape in it. The same with the leaves, where I think it's hitting the light, I put a lighter shape, and where I think it's turning away from the light, I put a darker shape. It's just kind of rough, and you can tell it feels a little bit stiff, like she has plastic hair. So we're gonna like soften that and make it really feel like part of this bigger shape. And again, what I love to do is using gradient. So this is the highlight area. I'm gonna add the layer mask. So let's really think about how the hair behave in a three-dimensional way, right? Like around the root, it's probably gonna be going in and catching less of the light. So I think the highlight is a little bit too strong and can be softened here. And what I do is just to sort of erase that part a bit with the gradient tool. Same with the hair that's behind the arm. That's probably a little bit of a cast shadow going on. But I want everything like sort of soft at this point, so I'm not really gonna put it in the cast shadow just yet. 
So I'm just going to soften that by erasing part of that highlight so it's still seeing through our base layer, which is these two layer um, here. Also, you see by making this area darker, all of a sudden this part is popping out. So it's a lot of like push and pull, kind of like sculpting, you know, like you have the big shapes first, uh, and then you get into the details, um, start chiseling the smaller moments out and making the piece more refined that way. So now I have all my secondary shapes in their happy place, happily blend in with the primary shapes. I think it's definitely an improvement from where we come from, but overall I feel like it's still lacking some of that warmth of the light. So now we're actually going to actively change this color with um, those helpful adjustment tools that are available in Photoshop. So this is one perk that digital tool has that traditional tool doesn't. Like if you painted something, you can't just make a slide and make it into like higher intensity or shift it into a different hue, but we can in this world. So we're gonna take advantage of that. Um, for example, here, I think I wish there's a little bit more warmth uh, with these strands up here compared to down here. So I'm going to get into the hair layers. Like, see, I titled it hair details. I'm going to go into hue saturation. Remember, we talked about that very early on. So this is the tool that allows you to manipulate the hue saturation of the color you already have. And then you can just kind of like slide around to see like how, well, that's pretty cool. I mean, like having a purple highlight, but I think I'm going for something a little bit more harmonious. Loving the yellow, but it's too a little too intense. So maybe not that much. Maybe let's say like a 15 and a little bit higher. So this allows us to shift the hue along on that color slider. This, I'm increasing the saturation a bit. And then that's the brightness. I think for the brightness, we can't just have it to be the same. And with the preview, this is what I use a lot, I find really helpful, is to compare the before and after. Uh, and that's so great at, you know, making decision. And I think it's an improvement, so I'm gonna go for it. I think overall the color does fuse a little bit dull as well. So I'm going into the background and kind of up that as well. Giving it a bit more um, saturation. So now, see, compare it, it feels a lot warmer. Yep. And then, this is really fun part, is you can start going into your secondary shapes and then start changing individual colors. Now we click off sample all layers, so it's only sampling this current layer. I think this process can be more uh, intuitive, like kind of what feels right. I mean, in some way, I'm just kind of like spacing things out uh, for this image. So it looks like, you know, not all the leaf color change is at one place. Um, okay. So maybe it would be cool if some of the leaves is a little bit more on the blue side. Because I mean, if you really look at a plant, like their color is so complex and it's impossible to completely emulate that. But here we have changed just a few leaves and all of a sudden, this tree feels like it has so much more color or just richness in color because I sort of space out um, the different blue leaves. And now I'm gonna go in with the lighter leaves as well. Again, sort of spacing it out. And then changing. I feel like why digital tool sometimes is so great for people who are not familiar with color because you can really see what is changing 
um, even without really knowing um, the theory behind it. But then through this process, you are actually learning how color work. So it's almost like you're learning while you're doing it, which is really great. And then you can keep going with the rest of the little shapes. So at this stage, I think we're almost done. And what I like to do usually when I wrap up a, a piece is to really push the volume even more with um, some shadows and highlights. And that's really, I think, the fun part because it just makes the objects a lot more pronounced all of a sudden. So what I'm going to do first is to add another layer called women shadow on top of the women layer and I like to create clipping mask. What that means is see how that little arrow? It means that now it's attached to this folder so whatever I draw it only appear in the area where the base layer is so what the layer that's being contained in this folder. So if I release the clipping mask, you can tell I'm just like drawing it everywhere. So it means that the effects I'm doing, whatever, is only applying to this layer and no other pixels in the background. So that comes in really handy when doing shadow because you don't need to really worry about going into the outline really clean. Let me show you what I mean. For example, I want a little bit cast shadow here, right? So with this edge, I have to be a little bit careful because it is this in the same layer. The hair and the flash is grouped in the same woman layer. But once I create clipping mask, see how these parts just got ultimately cleaned up. And then what I do is select multiply. And that gives a darker shade of color by blending the blue I just pick up and the flesh color of this body. Um, usually with a warmer light, you have a cooler shadow. So in this case, I just pick up this blue, sort of a neutral blue, and then apply it. So when you use multiply, usually the color get a more intense as well. So I tend to use a more neutral color to do it. Again, this is what it looks like when it's normal. And then when it's multiply, it looks like this with the layer clip and mask. So I'm going to go ahead and add where I think there should be shadow, like for example, uh, under the armpits here. Um, I'm also going to like attach this resources. So if you want to really understand how those blending layers work, like all of this, they all do like different things and they're especially helpful when it comes to manipulating photos. That resources is going to be very helpful. But usually the blending mode I use the most is the multiply for shadow. So for example, with this shadow, I feel like it shouldn't be this harsh when it get to the dress part. Then again, we are bringing out our very handy tool of layer mask and having that part sort of be erased. And that followed that curve a lot nicer. We can also add some shadows to the leaves um, to pop individual ones even better to give the illusion of an overall more voluminous tree. Same thing, multiply, for example, here. And then you can see maybe this color feels a little bit too light when we're using on the tree. Then we can always go back and then adjust that as well. Bringing the value down, like around there and then making it into normal so you can pick that up, that color we just created up. Bring it back to multiply so you can see what it looks like when it's being used as a shadow color.
So we can keep going on that, but see how like this area of the leaves feels like is popping from this area. So you're just adding extra volume to that shape. Um, and then we can also add some highlights where highlights usually are, such as the cheekbones. Can put it into detail folder we have here. And then with highlight, you can just pick the color that's on here and then um, move up to the value. Well, this is very close to white already, so there's not much more we can go from there. But you can still see. Okay. To move up the layer because it was behind the line layer. And then that feels like a little too much. So let's dial down the opacity. And the uh, white um, feels like it doesn't work on the lip as a highlight. It's just too white. So let's pick a light pink color. And there we go. And if you feel like maybe the flower can use some uh, dew, so it looks more like dewy and cute, we can do that too. At this point, it's just like, you know, adding the really final touches. Because the big part is already done. Now it's just like the cherry on top of the cake. So I think I'm done, and I think the piece is at a good place. I think you guys should also compare your final piece to the first version when you just apply the swatches from other people's palette you just stole, and then see how far you have come along and um, how you have made that into your own. So next step, I'm just going to show you how you're going to export your piece. So you can share it with all your friends and families and ex-boyfriends and ex-girlfriends. So now we have done our hard work. Of course, we have to tell the world about it. And the Photoshop files and layer is way too big to really share online. So now we are going to export it. What we're going to do is go to File, Export, Save for Web. Because I'm assuming you want to share it online. So let's see, save it as JPEG, unless you're making like a GIF thing, we're not. Um, I want it to be JPEG high, it just means like good quality. Um, and here you can look for up. What it means is that it shows you the four different versions of what quality is. As the quality goes down like here 15%, um, the file size is going to decrease with it. So I guess you just have to find that optimal point that you feel like is a, a good size. Like maybe you don't want to post something that's like, you know, like 59 megabyte, you know, that no one can open, but it's still good quality enough to really give your work the uh, credit it you. So here I think 60 uh, looks pretty good. And you can always like change the quality like to see if it makes any difference like 80. So one of the things they um, really help with reducing the quality and size is by limiting the color. Um, in our case, the color is not that complicated, so you don't see a very big difference. But if you see like use a photo or use something with a lot of variety of color, then as the uh, quality goes down, it's pretty noticeable. Like some color just um, won't be there anymore. Uh, Click convert to sRGB if you were not working in it or just click it to be safe because internet browsers use sRGB. And right now my size is pretty big because I feel like I might want to print this. I like this piece. It was work at 300 dpi. So this is really big. Um, I think for online, like around 1700, it's already really good. Um, it's good enough for like a sort of like a full flash out on your website page and just check everything copyright contact info um, that depends if you want to have it and you can set it like in a different part of photoshop um, preview monitor color yes yes then you just save wait for it load 
And you can save it as awesome piece into, for example, your desktop. Image JPEG, yes, save. And then we'll have our awesome piece right here. I really hope that you enjoy the project and feel like you learned something new. I think the biggest takeaway for this class is to conquer your fear in color. So I think stealing other people's color palette is really just a first step. When I started having a better understanding of colors, my palette definitely expanded. Um, and I feel like because of that, I have a wider range of vocabulary, especially to approach different subject matters. So I hope that now you find color a little less intimidating and excited to explore more. I can't wait to see what you have created. Thank you so much for taking this class.